today. We're on Facebook Live and YouTube now. Aren't you excited? Let's greet all the folks that are on Facebook Live this morning. Now, if you're thinking, well, I could have slept in, I could have just pulled my computer, laptop in my bed, my phone, and watched it. It's not the same as being here. Amen? Amen. But we're glad that they're here with us and have joined us this morning. We are in a series. It's, it's called Above All Names. And obviously, we're focusing on Jesus and Christmas. And the baby in the manger is what we should be all about. Amen? And we are going to be looking at the names, not random names this morning, but the names that were predicted that he would be called 700 years before he was born. Now imagine that. We'll be looking at the book of Isaiah, and I just want to set the backdrop or the context of this message that I say. This was a divided kingdom. Israel had fallen because of idolatry. This was after the kingdom of Solomon. There was a southern kingdom, which was Judah. Its capital was Jerusalem, and they stayed faithful longer. But then there was Israel, the northern kingdom, and the ten tribes meet, immediately went into idolatry and no longer worshipped God in Jerusalem. This was a dark time. Just before the Assyrians came and took Israel captive. And so that's where we see this ray of light, this glimmer of hope in this passage. So if you look with me to Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 through 6, it says, But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time he was made he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in, in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot, for every boot and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for, for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. I want to look back at verse 1 and just look at the description of the time. It says, But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali. This is Israel he's talking about. But in the latter time he has made a glorious... Glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. Historically, Galilee would fall first. But also remember, where was Jesus from? The light would shine from Galilee. Jesus was considered a Galilean. So 700 years in, in advance. Now, folks, we live in a dark time. There's political turmoil. There is idolatry in our land. We are a broken, divided nation, are we not? Can I get an amen? amen? So could there be something in the Word of God for us today? I would say absolutely. But then look at the hope that He gives. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, for the government shall rest upon His Shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Now, you might not think these names are very important, but I think that if you had to choose a name, you might not choose some of these names. 
Now, if you worked at Walmart, you wouldn't want the name Lois Price, would you? And if you were a little girl, you would not want a name like Eileen Wright. What if you leaned left? All right? I knew a guy named Kevin Oder. His dad's name was Ivan Oder. Would you like a name like that? Another, if your last name is a man, you don't want to name your little girl Anita. Anita Man. You wouldn't want to do that to her, would you? Now here's a new word for you that I'd never heard before. It's called an aptronym. Now some of you grammarians might get this, an aptronym. And what an aptronym is, is it's a, a name that matches an occupa occupation or a character trait. Like Usain Bolt, fastest man in the world, supposedly. Doesn't that sound fast? Usain Bolt. That's fast. Or Poet Williams Wordsworth. Or an astronaut named Sally Ride. Now, those are good names. My name, and I'm going to kind of preface this because <clears throat> I have a few antagonists in this congregation that would harass me, but my full name is Christopher. My mom dedicated to me before I was born. The, the name means Christ bearer, Christ bearer. And so I think I have and am fulfilling that name, that I have the opportunity to share Christ regularly and often, and it brings joy to my life. And so I was named something that I would become. So we need to be careful with how we name our children. Now in the message, this passage is not as, what I want to say, heartfelt for me, but I think you need to hear it in a different translation. Sometimes when I'm trying to look at a scripture from different perspectives, I will look at a different translation. The message says, for to us a child is born, <laughs> for a child has been born for us, the gift a son for us. He'll take over the running of the world. His names will be Amazing Counselor, Strong God, Eternal Father, Prince of Wholeness. Now that just kind of that doesn't get it for me. That just kind of doesn't work. It's not as poetic, I guess, that I'm drawn to that. But in the K in KJV, which is the New King James Version, maybe you learned it in the KJV. It says, "For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given." And the government, and, and in my King James, it was, shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. But notice the King James divides Wonderful and Counselor into two different ideas. Wonderful, unusual, beyond human capabilities. It awakens astonishment in us, doesn't it? Have you ever had a moment of wonder where maybe you were in the mountains and saw something beautiful or, or over a, a, a valley and it was beautiful? Or what is that Grand Canyon? Ever been to the Grand Canyon? How majestic and how awesome. Or the big sky of Montana and experience the awe and the wonder in that place. Now, I have a picture. I want you to identify what this picture is. Look, look at the screen. What is that? I can't hear you. Spider. Okay, it looks like a spider. They found this in a Peruvian jungle. I didn't find it. I wasn't in a Peruvian jungle. But what they found was a type of spider that took pieces of natural habitat, leaves and branches, and, and dirt, and this little spider made this huge, big spider, 10 times the size of itself, so that it would, would <coughs> run predators away, that they would stay away from his little web. And so what happens is 
that this little spider, this a little tiny spider will make this big spider, and then above this little this spider that you see, this camouflage spider, whatever you want to say, a fake spider, that little spider will will be on that web, and then when a predator comes, the little spider will play it like a puppet and twitch the web to make that the, the predator think that it is a live big spider. Isn't that cool? That's the wonder of God. Now, you might not think that's very cool, but I think it's cool. Now, I've got another slide. I want you to identify this. This is a, you were wrong. But let me tell you about the monarch butterfly. Since you think this was a monarch butterfly, a monarch butterfly eats milkweed. It's a very poisonous plant. Only the monarch is where, one of the very few butterflies that can eat the milkweed. And because it eats the milkweed as a caterpillar, then it gets this orange tint on its wings, which we're all familiar with. How many of you can remember the days when the monarchs would make their big trail throughout Indiana on their way through the Wabash Valley. Do you guys remember that? Anybody remember that other than me? I mean, there were like hundreds, thousands of monarchs that would came, come through our area. Anyway, long story short, this orange tint is toxic to birds. So if a bird would eat a monarch, it would get sick enough that it would never eat another monarch. Like I said, this is not a monarch. This is a viceroy butterfly, which is not nearly as toxic as the monarch. And so the birds see the orange, and they don't eat the viceroy, even though it's not as toxic. You see, that's the wonder of God. God's plan was to camouflage the viceroy. In fact, for some of you Kentucky fans, the viceroy is the in insect of Kentucky. Did you know that? Anybody know that? You learn all kinds of things. God is a wonderful God and a wonderful counselor his son would be. And that wonderful counselor is one that gives supernatural counsel beyond human experience. It's the wow wisdom of God that he places inside of you if you listen. A counselor is someone with the ability to discern and provide guidance for the good of God's people. Don't we need counselors? I was talking to someone early this morning, and we were talking about someone in a position of authority, and, and it was a pretty high position. And we were having a discussion, because there's no one to mentor them. There's no one to counsel them. But that is what they need. But they are in such a position that they have to seek that guidance because no one can really give them that guidance. Maybe you're in one of those positions. John, in John chapter 14, verses 16 and 17, records what Jesus said. And these are Jesus' words. And he says to his apostles, he said, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you a, another helper. Basically, that means another counselor. Another means that Jesus was their first counselor, but he's sending another, talking about the Holy Spirit. To be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. That's the Spirit of God living in you. You have a counselor that if you will listen, he will give you godly wisdom, the wow wisdom of God. Now, there are two types of counseling. There's the kind of emotional counseling. In fact, I had someone who stayed after service and first service and said, I just want to thank you for the church helping us with some counseling. It's made a huge difference in our lives. And because those that were going to counseling, their life was better, this person's life was better because of it. Emotional counseling. There was a counselor that was on the beach in Hawaii. He was kind of recovering from burnout. And lo and behold, as he was walking along the Pacific Ocean, beautiful scene, 
there was a bottle. He opened the bottle, or he picked up the bottle, and he opened the bottle, and out popped the genie. Don't you wish? And the genie says, thanks for freeing me. Because you freed me, I will give you one wish. The counselor said, you know, I've never liked the flight from California to Hawaii. I would prefer to drive. Will you build me a bridge from California to Hawaii? And the genie said, you know, that's asking quite a lot. Just think about the pylons I have to sink and the concrete and the pavement and how far it is. That's, that's impossible. The counselor said, okay, I'll let you off the hook. He said, just help me to understand people. Help me, to, help me help them through their trauma and their tragedy and their pain and their disappointment and their needs. And the genie said, do you want a two-lane or a four-lane bridge? Isn't, that what, isn't it that way? That's why we send our counseling out to guys and gals that do it all the time. Because you have to want to be counseled first of all. And most people don't want to change. The second kind of counseling is legal. Right now, I don't know which side of the aisle you're on, and I don't particularly care, just so you know. I won't tell you what news station I watch, but it's probably not the one you suspect. And I'm kind of tired of it all. All the drama, all the stuff that's going on. But our president has advisors. And the advisors are as only good as, good as the person who is to listen to the advisors and to make those decisions. That's one type of advisor. Another type of advisor is, well, can you imagine hiring a lawyer or a legal advisor and paying them a lot of money, two and $300 an hour, and then not listening and uh, at doing what the counselor said, the, the lawyer said? No, you wouldn't do that, would you? Now, in Scripture, this term counselor is parakletos in the Greek. It, it, it means the one that gives assistance. It, it means the one that is our advocate. He is our defense, but our lawyer, Jesus Christ, our counselor, gave his life for us so that we could have eternal life. He is invested more in the game than we are. Psalm chapter 1, verses 1 and 2 is one of my favorite psalms. It says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers, but in his delight, in, it, in the law of the Lord, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and, and on his law he meditates day and night. That's the counsel that we need. We need the word of God in our lives daily. Through this Christmas time, I just want to encourage you again to get a devotional. Get on you version. Take, do one of those short Christmas devotionals to set your heart for the Lord and Christmas. Now, if you'll remember with me in Isaiah, Israel in that moment was hopeless. They needed a wonderful counselor. They needed encouragement. They needed a glimmer of hope or of light just to make it through the darkness. And sometimes at Christmas time, it can be the most dark for us. Can't it? And the most lonely times of the year. It's supposed to be the happiest time of the year. And then you've got to ask yourself, why are these names so important? The expected one. The wonderful counselor. The mighty God. The everlasting father. The prince of peace. Because they are so relevant and so practical for our lives. Max Lucado says, fear doesn't want you to make the journey to the mountain. If he can rattle you enough, fear will persuade you to take your eyes off the peaks and settle for a dull existence in the flatland. That's what fear does. Fear in our lives will take away the joy and the celebration, the challenge of the peaks 
of our lives. Fear also is like a dense fog. Did you know that a fog that covers seven square blocks, 100 feet deep, that blocks your vision so you can't see ahead, is only one glass of water? That's all it is. But that fear can stop us from seeing ahead and enjoying our lives. Many of our worries are like small trees that temporarily cast long shadows. Do you worry a lot? Don't we live in a fearful, anxious culture, a depressed culture, if you will? I like Dr. Robert Elliott's two rules. The first rule is this, don't sweat the small stuff. And you know what the second rule is? Everything is small stuff. Isn't it? Haven't you worried about things that have never come to fruition? Haven't you been fearful of things that never come to pass? Let me ask you this. What's the last thing you do before you go to sleep at night? Are you fixated on some fear or worry? Are you anxious? Or can you go right to sleep? This is how some people experience joy at Christmas. They don't look very happy. Is that how you experience joy? See, worry will poison our lives and ruin our holidays. Is it poisoning your life? I have a picture of a plant. Anybody know what this is? It is... I stumped you. Wolf's bane. Ever heard of wolf's bane? If you wear, if you wear, if you read werewolf no novels, obviously you know wolf's bane kills werewolves. Comes, it comes in pretty handy for you, doesn't it? Not so much. But did you know that this flower that's now suddenly gone, this flower is one of the most poisonous plants in the world, and it does grow in North America. Do not plant this in your yard, because with a cut, or especially the roots, but, but the flower itself, if it gets into a cut, it can cause paralysis and eventually death. It killed, in 2014, it killed a gardener, and they, did, they couldn't figure out why he had paralysis, and it slowly paralyzed all of his organs and until he died. So very, very dangerous. Why do I tell you this? Because worry is like that. It'll, it'll take your life and one thing at a time destroy and paralyze you to the point that you don't even want to live. That is wolf's pain. Worry is wolf's pain. Rick Warren said, worry is the warning light that God really is not first in my life at this particular moment. Worry is the warning light that God is really not first in my life at this particular moment. Do you worry? Oswald Chambers wrote, all worry is caused by calculating without God. Calculating without God. Do you calculate without God? What do these names mean for us when our lives are dominated by fear and anxiety and stress and worry? We're reminded that we have a wonderful counselor that cares for us, that gave his all for us. Jesus came to release us from the fear and the worry and the anxiety to be our counselor. Psalm 16, 7 and 8 says, I bless the Lord who gives me counsel in the night. Also, my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. Because we have the Lord. Our faith should be in God. Psalms 33, 10 and, 10 and 11 says, The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. Is he your wonderful counselor? My question for you this morning is simply this. Where 
does the attorney sit, the defense attorney sit in the courtroom next to his client? Next to his client. Jesus is sitting next to you. The Holy Spirit resides in you. You have a wonderful counselor. Now, let me tell you why I don't counsel people. It's kind of negative. There's, there's kind of two reasons that I don't. I have a master's in counseling, by the way. I think I'm pretty good. Thanks for the laugh. <clears throat> One is because typically when the pastor counsels people, you lose them out of your congregation because you're too close. And there can be that too closeness so that when I preach, people think that I'm preaching to them. I'm not, but you can't get that out of their head. Number two is, first of all, if you go to a counselor, you got to be honest. That's the number one thing. I can't have a client, I can't have a patient if they're not honest. And guess what? If you're not honest with God, He's not fooled. You're just not being honest with yourself when you go to Him. Second of all, as a counselor, and if I give you advice, you've got to listen. I can always tell if I've got a client or somebody that just wasted my time because they don't listen. They don't hear. God knows where you're, whether you're listening to Him or not, doesn't He? Whether you're really, really tuning in and hearing Him. And third and finally, you know if you've got a client or not, whether they obey, whether they follow through and do what you've asked them to do. God knows whether you're really a follower or not by how you obey. Now, you're not earning your salvation, but he knows whether you're being honest, whether you're listening, and then when he tells you something to do, are you doing what he tells you to do, or are you ignoring the instructions? That's why I'm not a counselor. Now, you have a wonderful counselor that, what, you need to be honest with, you need to listen to, and you need to obey. And if you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life, then you don't have him as your counselor, and you need that wonderful counselor in your life. Would you please stand as I close in prayer? Father, we thank you for this day, and we are thankful that you sent a wonderful counselor in Jesus that changed our world, that gave us hope, that gave us light in the darkness, that, Father, that can unite division and change us and change our world. And, Father, we put our faith and our trust in him and in you. Father, for those that don't know you, don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, we pray that they would come. For those that aren't listening, Father, we pray that you would cause them to hear and obey. Father, we just need to be honest with you, and we just pray that we would do your will. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We come this morning.